Good morning and welcome as we gather the baptized children of God of faith on a day that is just brimming with hope. You know we'll be receiving new members today, the Sagers and the Andersons, and as I was reflecting on the fact that in the midst of a pandemic we're receiving new members here at faith, at first I thought, well, the theological way of looking at that is that's a sign of hope. But I think a better theological way of looking at, at receiving members in a pandemic is a sign of God's certainty in us. So we're grateful and glad to be together this day. There will be a reception of new members, that is the right to receive new members will happen during the service, and, uh, and yet we will not have a, a regular party reception after that. But we do invite you to greet the Segers and the Andersons outside as we finish and complete our worship today. Also, we are blessing the backpacks and the satchels as I have shared uh, we hope if you are a teacher as well or an assistant at school, if you have brought a satchel, we wish to bless that in your ministry of education as well as blessing the backpacks and the book bags of the children. Uh, that will happen during the children's message time, as you note in your bulletin. Um, I'm also bringing my satchel to bless, but on top of that, because I'm a dedicated writer and I believe in safety, I realized this morning I need to bless my bicycle bag as well. So a blessing happens today as we, as we greet so many uh, wonderful things in the life of the church. We are so grateful, Rosa, for your gift of musical leadership. Thank you very much for that ministry. We continue to pray that uh, Adam will have safe journeys back. The gift of music is truly a great gift here at Faith. You'll probably notice that the service has been augmented a bit because of the addition of the two different rites, the rite of the blessing of backpacks and the rite of the reception of new members. Uh, there will be no blessing of the holy baptism, but there will be, this service will move from this point on to the singing of the entrance hymn. And so as you are able, I invite you to rise with me for the singing of the hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also you. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia.
Let us pray. Gracious God, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Give us this bread always that we may live, he may live in us and we in him, and that strengthened by this food, we may live as the body in the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated as your as you're uh, gathered today for the blessing, and I invite the young people to come up with your backpacks for the blessing of the backpacks. And also, if you have educators with backpacks, college students, university graduate students, campers as well, the blessing of the bags. What a great day to be here. We all have our bags and our satchels. I know that Mr. Tim has brought his his wonderful, beautiful, mysteriously miraculous laptop, right? With wonders to behold. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll begin. Hear this reading. This is from the 10th chapter of Mark. People were bringing little children in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such of these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Let us pray. And boys and girls, I'm going to let you break a rule. You don't have to put your hands together. But grab hold of your backpacks and your book bags, and I will mine as well, and we'll pray. As we get ready to start another year in school, we ask your blessing on these book bags, backpacks, camping tents, and laptops, and especially on these children who will wear them. And as they do, the very important work of being students, bless them with eagerness to learn that their world may grow large, respect for teachers and students, that they may form healthy relationships, love for nature, that they may become caretakers of your creation, happiness when learning is easy, and stick to itiveness when it's hard, and faith in Jesus as their best teacher and closest friend. We ask that you would protect these, your children, watch over them and keep them safe as they travel to and from school, as they learn, help them also to discover the different gifts that you would give them to be used in work in the world. And now, boys and girls, raise your backpacks up as they hear the many voices that fill their days. Help them to listen most carefully for your voice, the one that tells them you love them always, no matter what. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the big children to go ahead and find their seats, and I'm going to ask the younger children to stay here for the children's message. Remember what happens today? You remember the mystery box? Well, okay. So Alice, I think, brought the mystery box today. Is that right? And Alice, as I've always said, and many of you have heard this before, some of you haven't, there are the three rules of the mystery box, right? You can't be alive, you can't be dead. <laughs> Mom and dad also always have to say okay. All right, so I can feel that there's something in here. I'm gonna open it up and what we're gonna do again is we're trying to teach ourselves to look at our world and everything we see every day. We can somehow help that remind us of Jesus. So I'm gonna try to see how this reminds me of Jesus love oh my goodness what do I have in here I have a little baby a little child when you think of little children how, what would you say about little children 
I'll start. Little children need help. What else would you say about little children? They cry a lot, uh huh. <laughs> what else about little children? I watched a little video of my granddaughter who's four months old. She took a spoon and threw it across the room. <laughs> little children grow up to be softball players sometimes. Little children need so much. But I want to start with little children need help. They need to be protected. You know, when Jesus was born, he was a little tiny baby, right? Well, just imagine Jesus as a little baby. He needed mommy to hold him and feed him. He cried, probably. He needed to be warm, and so he needed his mommy and daddy to keep him warm. He was very, very much in the need of help. And yet Jesus grew up to save the whole world and to love you always. And that means even when you sometimes feel like, I don't know if mommy and daddy listen to me, or I can't do all the things I see older children do. If you ever feel like you're too young to matter or wish that you were older, just remember Jesus felt the same way that you feel. And that's why Jesus can love you so much. He knows what it's like to be a small child growing up hoping for a really wonderful life, which I know you'll have. Alice, you did a great job. I'm so proud of you. Thank you very much. Pass that to Alice. And why don't we decide who's going to take the mystery box home, okay? Pass this around. Pull the chip out. Don't say what number you have yet. We'll wait till the end. And remember, the one with the highest number takes it home, fills it with something to stump Pastor John, unless you took it home this time. Then we go to the next highest number. Okay, we ready? Oh, we need to give one to Alice. There you go. <laughs> That's a good big sister. There we go. Okay, hold your numbers up. What do we have? We got one, six, two, eleven. Alice, you got the highest number, but you took it home, so we'll give it to the next highest number, which is... Looks like, oh boy. You're going to give me a hard time again, aren't you? Okay. Let's put our chips back in. Let's put our hands together. Let's say our prayer. And remember, we're always going to say goodbye the way we do at church at the end. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that your son Jesus was a baby once and knows what it's like to be a child. And thank you, O oh God, for knowing what every child wants in life. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for our family and our church, and thank you for your love. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grab your backpacks. Oh, and we have our tags. Thank you so much. Our service continues. The first lesson for this morning is from the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. This passage advances the story of the conflict between prophet Elijah and Jezebel, who is the queen of Israel. And at this point, she has sworn vengeance against him because he has, he has killed hundreds of her pagan prophets, and Elijah is running for his life. So we begin with verse 4. Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. 
Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the man of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So then, putting away all falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil come in out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you are marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as you're able for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the crowd, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we knew? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus said to them, do not complain among yourselves. No one came, can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. It seems so long ago, but it's only been a week, that I gathered here with the blanket on a Wednesday afternoon. The preschool children had finished their morning sessions, and it was time for chapel. And so the boys and the girls gathered here. They sat on the blanket. I sat before them with my guitar. And before we began our chapel, I asked the children to look behind us. And there in the center of the room was this baptismal font. I told the boys and girls that this wooden piece of furniture included a bowl. And inside the bowl, I said, is water. I told them at the end of our chapel time, I'm going to ask you to walk past this font 
and I'm going to sprinkle water on you. And I said, the water that I sprinkle on you should remind you that Jesus loves you and that you love Jesus too. And as we sang our songs after that instruction, I could tell that some of the boys and the girls, especially a, a girl, a little girl at the very back of the group, they kept looking back at the font somewhat furtively, ready to walk by the font. At the end of our song time, I told the children again, remember what the font means. Remember that the water that I will sprinkle you with reminds us that, that we love Jesus. Well, when I said that, the little girl sitting in the back of the group said, and God, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and I love the fact, as I wrote later, that that morning uh, a four-year-old would uh, give a lesson in medieval Trinitarian theology. But what I loved about the children, and especially that response, was <laughs> that child's certainty. As I mentioned earlier, today is a day of certainty, a certainty of God's love for us. And as I smiled at the girl, I just couldn't help but remember that that child was so certain of God's love. She had been taught well in words and probably example by her parents. Today, we are going to be embracing two new households who will be coming to us as a sign of their own certainty in God's love. And we will celebrate and affirm those two households as a way of affirming that we are not only certain of God's love, but we are also certain of God's love and God's life for us, even in the midst of our uncertainty. The Andersons and the Sagers will join us, and they will join us in our celebration of life. They will join us in our wrestling with our uncertainties. They will join us as things as large as a pandemic and things as small as worry over a relative are a part of our uncertainties and our, and our daily questions. And they will join us as we again celebrate that every day of our life is a day that we walk away from the font, so to speak, dripping wet in our baptism dripping wet and certain of God's promise and covenant with us through baptism. But John's gospel gives us the image of people who aren't so certain, some who are very certain, others who are clouded with their doubts. The gospel of John gives us the picture of Jesus surrounded by a crowd that has been following and even chasing him from place to place. And as we've read through these these various passages from the sixth chapter of John over the last weeks, we have seen that Jesus is followed by people who are dead certain of their lives and the answers that they have in their lives and ready to trip Jesus up. And he's also followed by those who, those who, are, who are not certain at all about their lives and the trajectory of their faith and the place of Yahweh in their lives. But some who are confronting Jesus in this gospel lesson, who indeed wish to trip Jesus up, are people who believe that, very, that by their birthright, by their ancestry, their lineage, they have a stamp of approval. A stamp of approval because they are, they are heirs of Abraham and Moses. A stamp of approval because they have been worshiping in the, in the temple community. And they take for granted that, that they are favored people and have issue with this Christ, this Jesus, who comes and speaks on behalf of God, who has the temerity to say that, that he is God's voice piece. They seem more certain than you and I often seem. Yesterday I was uncertain I would climb that final hill after a 40-mile bike ride in the hills. Very uncertain about that. But the uncertainty that we, that we encounter each day of our lives has much more weight than any of that. We are concerned about family who struggle through these times. We're concerned about our place in the, uh, in the employment field. We're concerned about the, the, the richness of our faith and our ability to influence and help and guide other people. 
There's so many things that we're uncertain about, so many things that we struggle with. And even the small minor struggles, when compounded, when collected, can sometimes leave us feeling just as dull as a worn out kitchen knife. Life confronts us, every one of us, with uncertainty and enough to worry about for a lifetime. I was just recently reading some comments made by fellow pastors across the United States. As one pastor shared her deep sorrow and the shakiness of her faith and asked simply how her pastor colleagues retained their faith or had they ever felt uncertain about faith. And the responses just fell in upon her like an avalanche as one colleague after another shared their own struggles with faith despite their place of leadership in the faith community. One colleague named Mary responded, how can you confront the shakiness of your faith? Well, she said, and she wrote, simply borrow from the rest of the church. No one in this faith community is alone. And another colleague named Francis said, when my six-month-old daughter was diagnosed with cancer, my faith was gone. There should be a word way beyond atheism. I was in the desert. I took a long, long walk, many long walks. I did not go looking to renew my faith. I just walked and walked. It's amazing, she continued to write, where healing and epiphanies come from. And yet another pastor colleague named Claire wrote about her own struggles with faith in her life. She wrote, a couple of people suggested to allow the faith of others to carry you. That helped me when my firstborn died at two weeks old. It took several years of sitting in worship and letting their prayers and their hymn singing wash over me. And I shared my own response. I said, my bucket has been empty many times and I hope it helps you to know that you're not alone. You're surrounded by a cloud of sometimes vexed witnesses. And so maybe one way to describe the community of faith that we celebrate today as we receive new households in this community of faith, maybe one way to describe the church is that we are those who struggle with faith along the countryside. We are the community in the cloud of witnesses, the cloud of vexed and confused sometimes witnesses, and maybe the fact that we struggle with faith, our confusion, our doubts, or maybe the dryness of our faith, it doesn't seem like an alert or an alarm, but simply a fact of life. Perhaps the fact that we have those feelings and those doubts and struggles is a beautiful gift that reminds us that though confused, our confusion and doubt, just as our joys and celebrations, are signs that we are alive and that we recognize those emotions. Maybe it's a strength or a sign of the Holy Spirit that this little certain child in chapel alluded to, that we are sometimes vexed or confused. And maybe the feelings of confusion or doubt can also remind us that we are God's children, we are alive, but we're not alone. There's more, too. I think Jesus' response to the people in this crowd points to two different ways that we can approach life and faith. This crowd, peopled by those Pharisees and those who believed in the birthright of their faith, in their certainty, and others in the crowd who felt uncertain, and that relied solely on their doubts from day to day. By first, Jesus announces that that pedigree, Jesus' followers are trying to say that they claimed a sense of certainty, that they were certain about every answer in their life. But Jesus is replying to them which points us to another way of life that might not include the illusion that we can not always be certain about everything. He says to them that they are drawn by God, that we are drawn by God. You know, as our dinner and discussion group gathered Wednesday, we looked at the original language of this gospel text, and in the original language, Jesus is not saying that God is drawing them, nothing so beautiful and poetic. The original language more or less says God's dragging us ahead. God is pulling us. 
It's God who pulls, God who drags. It's God's work, salvation. Our certainty lays not in our own ability to figure things out, but our certainty relies in God's pull, God's initiative, God's work. How Pauline, how Lutheran. We are not saved by our own certainty, by our own sense of faith, but we are saved apart from our works of the law. We are saved by the God who pulls us and drags us ahead. And that is to say that God is drawing us ahead to God's preferred destiny for us. And that, in the middle of anything else that can bother us in life, that can give us a great sense of certainty. Certainty in the God who draws us ahead who pulls us onward, who drags us into grace and mercy. The collection of the people who are dragged ahead by the merciful God, who drags them into mercy and love and life, is called the church. The church is the gathering of the sisters and brothers who embody this love of God. And while we're not always as certain as, as a small four-year-old in chapel, we are certain in the God who is certain of us. We lead our lives as if we are walking away from the font dripping in the waters of baptism, certain of the God who will constantly lead us ahead. And by receiving the Sagers and the Andersons into this household of faith, we are embodying God's desire for us to be a church growing in life, drawn ahead, constantly certain of God's mercy for us. Who do we love? For this we love Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our continued service follows after this with the hymn of the day. I invite you to be seated, and at this point, I invite the Anderson and Sager households to gather with me near the font. The service for the reception of new members through affirmation of baptism is found in your worship folder. Good to see you this morning. And you can continue to face me at the end. I'll invite you to turn and face the people. Dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for these people, one with us in the body of Christ, who are making public affirmation of their baptism. We are presenting Robin and Clay Anderson and Emily and David Sager, who desire to make public affirmation of their baptism, and with Haley and Alice Anderson, who are becoming members of Faith Lutheran Church. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for these sisters and brothers whom you have made your own by water and the word and baptism. You have called them to yourself, enlightened them with the gift of your spirit, and nourished them in the community of faith. Uphold your servants in the gifts and promises of baptism and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Dear friends, we also give thanks for the gift of baptism as we come before God to make public affirmation of baptism into Christ. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you that you have made us your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called us to yourself, enlightened us with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished us in the community of faith. Uphold us and all your servants in the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask uh, Emily and David, Robin and Clay to speak, and Robin and Clay, you'll be speaking on behalf of Haley and Alice. 
I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, the powers of this world that rebel against God, and the ways of sin that draw you from God, you may each say together, I renounce them. I ask the gathered assembly, do you believe in God the Father? We may all respond by saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God and Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? I ask David, Emily, Robin, and Clay to respond by saying, I do and I ask God to help and guide me. I ask the assembly people of God, do you promise to support these sisters and brothers and pray for them in their life in Christ? I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Robin, Clay, Emily, and David the gift of your Holy Spirit, confirm their faith, guide their lives, empower them in their serving. Give them patience in suffering and bring them to everlasting life. Amen. And now I invite our president forward. I'm going to invite you to turn and face the people. <laughs> Jim? Let us rejoice with these sisters and brothers in Christ. We rejoice with you in the life of baptism. Together we will give thanks and praise to God and proclaim the good news to all the world. And Tim, I think you have something to share with the family. And as Tim does that, let me just share a couple of words uh, just about the Sagers to begin with. You know, um, the Sagers, Emily and David, have been with us since the outdoor services and been watching and rejoicing over the church as we've moved through these times. I'm excited to know, first of all, uh, David reminds me of my own ancestors who are woodworkers and enjoys that. When I talk to Rob and I, I love the fact that she is uh, in the field of history as a profession and that touches the part of me that loves history. Clay is a geologist and have earlier, I believe, Clay, you had worked with Mark LaRue. Yes. So there is a connection there. Uh, we are just so excited and happy you that you are a part of the family of faith. These gifts are just a small token of our happiness for you. And I think everyone wants to join me in applause. <laughs> Thank you. Please uh, welcome the Sagers and Andersons after worship. Please rise as you are able.
right to give our thanks and praise. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come, as we gather for the words of institution. At this moment, we invite you to take your kit and hold them. There will be a moment of silent meditation immediately following the Lord's Prayer. Please raise your kits. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Raising our kits, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Let us pause for a moment of meditation. body of Christ given for you. Please take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Please take and drink. And let me the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us life, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen.
and peace, share the good news. Hallelujah. We invite you outside to greet the new families. 